Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Before we begin our program, I'd like to let you know that free newsletters are available from our ministry. Just email us at cdebater at aol.com and give us your mailing address and we'll mail them out to you for free. You can also call us at 512-218-8022 and leave your address there. You can also access all our newsletters online by going to one of our three websites called BibleQuery.org. Once on the homepage, simply click on the Experience box and then scroll down to the newsletter section as shown here. Since our number one most watched video of the over 548 videos we have produced for YouTube at the time of this recording is... Unpopular Bible Doctrines Number 1, The Biblical God No One Wants to Know, with over 433,000 viewings, our latest newsletter is called Unpopular Topic, How Sovereign is God. Our second most viewed YouTube video is Six-Year-Old Wife of Muhammad Was Okay by the Muslim God Allah, But Not by the Biblical God of Jesus with over 341,000 viewings. We also have three newsletters available on Islam. Our video, Debate, Larry Wessels versus Two Jehovah's Witnesses at a University Study Center, currently has close to 150,000 views. See our newsletter on the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, Deceive Deceivers. Our video, Is Jesus God Almighty in the Flesh, meaning the second person of the Trinity, or is he something else, has over 101,000 viewings. See our newsletter, Testimony to the Eternal Godhead, the Trinity. Our video, Biography, the famous 19th century Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a man of God, has close to 89,000 views. See two of our newsletters with lead articles from sermons by Spurgeon. Our video, UFOs, Ancient Aliens or Beings of the Fourth Dimension, number one, fact or fiction, has over 207,000 viewings. Not only do UFOs and the occult use the same disciplines such as levitation, teleportation of objects, psychokinesis, clairvoyance, automatic writing, and telepathy, but their theologies are completely foreign to biblical Christianity. UFO theologies include everything from reincarnation and evolution to man achieving cosmic godhood but they do not include Jesus Christ as the only mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. We have two newsletters related to the world of the occult to which UFOs are a part. Our video, Former Roman Catholic Bride of Christ Nun Testifies of Abnormal Life in the Convent, has over 67,000 viewings. Our video featuring former Roman Catholic Rob Zins, who has a Master of Theology from Dallas Theological Seminary, historical split between Roman Catholicism and the Christ of the Scripture, man's word or God's word, has over 53,000 viewings. See our two newsletters on the subject of Roman Catholicism. Our video, Cult of Ellen G. White, number one, Beginnings of the 19th century religion, called Seventh-day Adventism, has over 48,000 viewings and features former Seventh-day Adventist Wallace Slattery, who has 44 years' experience with this religion. Our playlist, called Dealing with Seventh-day Adventism and Their Prophetess, features 15 videos with 14 hours of material. See our newsletter, Seventh-day Adventism, True or False. For theological music lovers, see our video, Favorite 
old time Christian bluegrass gospel music, Psalm 98 verses four and five. With over 214,000 viewings, we have also posted several music videos by my own daughter, Marlena Wessels, from her CD, Win This Fight, songs she has written and performed herself. To see our music videos, please go to our main YouTube channel page. Scroll down to our multiple playlists. Arrow over to our playlist called Our Radio Shows with National Christian Authors and Music Vids. Once there, scroll down to the bottom of the playlist where the music videos are listed. I could go on and on, but this should be sufficient for now. Don't forget to check out our main YouTube channel, C Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television, also which has over 19 playlists by topic as you scroll down our channel page. Now, on with our main presentation. We would now like to turn our attention to one of the most famous sermons ever preached. It relates directly to the doctrines we have been discussing. The sermon is entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and was written and preached by one of America's greatest theologians, Jonathan Edwards. The sermon was given at Enfield, July 8, 1741, during the times of the Great Awakening in church history, when many thousands of people came to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18, 19, and 21 must be solemnly remembered before hearing this sermon. Quote, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Therefore, this sermon may sound like foolishness to most. If one considers for a moment that Edward's message is based on the Bible and that God has sovereignly chosen to save people by the foolishness of preaching, the truths uttered in the sermon may be even more astonishing. And for those of you who cannot believe God can be such a merciless avenger, consider for a moment Psalm 5, verse 5. Quote, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight, and thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Now that seems to be a fairly strong indictment against workers of iniquity by the Lord, where the, the word hate is right there in the scriptures. Uh, we also would like to consider Psalm 11, starting in verse 5 and continuing to verse 6. And it says, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest, this shall be the portion of their cup. So, God there states once again that he hateth, hateth uh, the wicked and him that loveth violence. And of course, he brings all the plagues afterwards on him. Also, uh, consider God's wrath even against individuals. Uh, specific judgment and wrath, as we find in uh, Romans chapter 9, in verse 13, it says, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So once again, we see the Lord stating his uh, acute dislike or hatred towards certain individuals. And uh, we must now state that, just as it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, uh, that, quote, God is love. So it also says in Nahum chapter 1, 
verses 2 through 8, which I'll read to you right now, uh, the following. Quote, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries, and, is, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in a day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight, and will pursue his enemies into darkness so we see here in first john chapter 4 verse 16 and also nahum chapter 1 verses 2 through 8 uh the attributes of the holy god of israel displayed on the one hand the love on the other hand the wrath uh to say that god is only love is to negate his other attributes not once in the acts of the apostles did they ever preach the love of god uh, the overriding attribute of God is holiness, not love, meaning that God has a holy love and a holy wrath. Besides, how can a God that is only love and nothing else have a loving wrath? The Holy Spirit is not known as the loving spirit. And Revelation chapter 4 verse 8 does not say, Love, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. No, Revelation chapter 4, verse 8 says, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So, right there you had the clear biblical definition of the, the really the overriding attribute of God, which is holiness. And uh, keeping all this in mind, let us now hear the excerpts from Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, read by Thomas Gross. Deuteronomy 32, 35, Their foot shall slide in due time. And this verse has threatened the vengeance of God on the wicked, unbelieving Israelites who were God's visible people and who lived under the means of grace, but who, notwithstanding all God's wonderful works towards them, remained void of counsel, having no understanding in them. Under all the cultivations of heaven, they brought forth bitter and poisonous fruit. As in the next two verses, next preceding the text, the expression I have chosen for my text, their foot shall slide in due time, seems to imply the following things, relating to the punishment and destruction to which these wicked Israelites were exposed that they were always exposed to destruction as one that stands or walks in slippery places is always exposed to fall. This is implied in the manner of their destruction, coming upon them being represented by their foot sliding. The same is expressed in Psalm 73, 18. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. It implies that they were always exposed to sudden, unexpected destruction. As he that walks in slippery places is every moment liable to fall, he cannot foresee one moment whether he shall stand or fall the next. And when he does fall, he falls at once without warning, which is also expressed in Psalm 73, 18, 19. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into destruction as in a moment? Another thing implied is that they are liable to fall of themselves without being thrown down by the hand of another, as he that stands or walks on slippery ground needs nothing but his own weight to throw him down. That the reason why they are not fallen already and do not fall now is only that God's appointed time is not come. For it is said that when that due time or appointed time comes, their foot shall slide. 
Then they shall be left to fall as they are inclined by their own weight. God will not hold them in these slippery places any longer, but will let them go, and then at that very instant they shall fall into destruction, as he that stands in such slippery, declining ground on the edge of a pit, he cannot stand alone. When he is let go, he immediately falls and is lost. The observation from the words that I would now insist upon is this. There is nothing that keeps wicked men at any one moment out of hell but the mere pleasure of God. By the mere pleasure of God, I mean his sovereign pleasure, his arbitrary will, restrained by no obligation, hindered by no manner of difficulty, any more than if nothing else but God's mere will had in the least degree or in any respect whatsoever any hand in the preservation of wicked men one moment. The truth of this observation may appear by the following considerations. There is no one of power in God to cast wicked men into hell at any moment. They deserve to be cast into hell so that divine justice never stands in the way. It makes no objection against God using his power at any moment to destroy them. Yea, on the contrary, justice calls aloud for infinite punishment of their sins. Divine justice says of the tree that brings forth such grapes of Sodom, Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? Luke 13, 7. The, divine, the sword of divine justice is every moment brandished over their heads, and it is nothing but the hand of the arbitrary mercy and God's mere will that holds it back. They're already under sentence of condemnation to hell. They do not only justly deserve to be cast down thither, but the sentence of the law of God, that eternal and immutable rule of righteousness that God has fixed between him and mankind, is gone out against them and stands against them so that they are bound over already to hell. John 3:18. He that believeth not is condemned already, so that every unconverted man properly belongs to hell. That is his place, from thence he is. John 8, 23. Ye are from beneath, and thither he is bound. It is the place that justice and God's word and the sentence of his unchangeable law assign to him. They are now the objects of that very same anger and wrath of God that is expressed in the torments of hell. And every reason why they do not go down to hell at each moment is not because God in whose power they are is not then very angry with them as he is with many miserable creatures now tormented in hell and there feel and bear the fierceness of his wrath. Yea, God is a great deal more angry with great numbers that are now on earth Yea, doubtless with many that are now in this congregation, who it may be, are at ease, than he is with many of those who are now in the flames of hell, so that it is not because God is unmindful of their wickedness and does not resent it, that he does not let loose his hand and cut them off. God is not altogether such a one as themselves, though they imagine him to be so. The wrath of God burns against them. Their damnation does not slumber. The pit is prepared, the fire is made ready, the furnace is now hot, ready to receive them. The flames do rage and glow, the glittering sword is wet and held over them. The pit hath opened its mouth um, under them. The devil stands ready to fall upon them and seize them at what moment God shall permit him. They belong to him. He has their souls in his possession and under his dominion. The scripture represents them as his goods. Luke 6, 12. The devils watch them. They are ever by them. At their right hand they stand waiting for them like greedy, hungry lions that see their prey and expect to have it, but are for the present kept back. If God should withdraw his pen by which they are restrained, they would in one moment lie upon their poor souls. The old serpent is gaping for them. Hell opens its mouth wide to receive them, and if God should permit it, they would be hastily 
swallowed up and lost. There are in the cells of wicked men those hellish principles reigning that would presently kindle and flame out into hell fire if it were not for God's restraints. This is laid in the very nature of carnal men, a foundation for the torments of hell. These are the corrupt principles in reigning power in them and in full possession of them that are seeds of hell fire. These principles are active and powerful, exceeding violent in their nature. And if it were not for the restraining hand of God upon them, they would soon break out. They would flame after the same manner as the same corruptions, the same enmity does in the hearts of damned souls, and would beget the same torments as they do in them. The souls of wicked are in Scripture compared to the troubled seas. Isaiah 42:20. For the present, God restrains their wickedness by his mighty power, as he does the raging waves of the troubled sea, saying, Hitherto shalt thou come, and no further. But if God should withdraw that restraining power, it would soon carry all before it. Sin is the ruin and misery of the soul. It is destruction in its nature. And if God should leave it without restraint, there would need nothing else to make the soul perfectly miserable, the corruption of the heart of man is immoderate and boundless in its fury. And while wicked men live here, it is like pent up by God's restraint. Whereas if it were let loose, it would set on the fire the course of nature. And as the heart is now a sink of sin, so if sin was not restrained, it would immediately turn the soul into a fiery oven or a furnace of fire and brimstone. All wicked men's pains and contrivance which they use to escape hell, while well, they continue to reject Christ and so remain wicked men, do not secure them from hell one moment. Almost every natural man that hears of hell flatters himself that he shall escape it. He depends upon himself for his own security. He flatters himself in what he has done and what he is now doing or what he intends to do. Everyone lays out matters in his own mind how he shall avoid damnation, and flatters himself that he contrives well for himself, and that his schemes will not fail. They hear indeed that there are but few saved, and that the greater part of men that have died hitherto for are gone to hell, but each one imagines that he lays out matters better for his own escape than others have done. He does not intend to come to that place of torment, he says within himself that he intends to take the effectual care and to order matters so for himself as not to fail. But the foolish child of miserable men delude themselves in their own schemes and in confidence in their own strength and wisdom. They trust to nothing but a shadow. The greater part of those who hitherto have lived under the same means of grace and are now dead are undoubtedly gone to hell. And it was not because they were not as wise as those who are now alive. It was not because they did not lay out matters as well for themselves to secure their own escape. If we could speak with them and inquire of them one by one, whether they expected when alive and when they used to hear about hell ever to be subjects of that misery, we doubtless should hear one and another reply, No, I never intended to come here. I had laid out matters otherwise in my mind. I thought I should contrive well for myself. I thought my scheme good. I intended to take effectual care, but it came upon me unexpected. I did not look for it at that time, and in that manner it came as a thief. Death outwitted me. God's wrath was too quick for me. Oh, my cursed foolishness. I was flattering myself and pleasing myself with vain dreams of what I would do hereafter. And when I was saying, peace and safety, then sudden destruction came upon me. So that thus it is that natural men are held in the hand of God over a pit of hell. They, are, they have deserved the fiery pit and are already sentenced to it. And God is fretfully provoked. His anger is as great towards them as to those that are actually suffering in the executions of the fierceness of his wrath in hell 
and they have done nothing in the least to appease or abate that anger. Neither is God in the least bound by any promise to hold them up one moment. The devil is waiting for them. Hell is gaping for them. The flames gather and flash about them and would fain laid hold on them and swallow them up. The fire pent up in their own heart is struggling to break out and they have no interest in any mediator. There are no means within reach that can be any security to them. In short, they have no refuge, nothing to take hold of. All that preserves them every moment is the mere arbitrary will and uncovenanted, unobliged forbearance of an incensed God. The bow of God's wrath is bent, and the arrow's made on the string, and justice bends the arrow at your heart and strains the bow, and it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood. Thus all you that never passed under a great change of heart by the mighty power of the Spirit of God upon your souls, all you that were never born again and made new creatures and raised from being dead in sin to a state of new and before altogether unexperienced light and life or in the hands of an angry God. However, you may have reformed your life in many things and may have had religious affections and may keep up a form of religion in your families and closets and in the house of God. It is nothing but his mere pleasure that keeps you from being this moment swallowed up into everlasting destruction. However unconvinced you may now be of the truth of what you hear, by and by you will be fully convinced of it. Those that are gone from being in the like circumstances with you see that it was so with them, for destruction came suddenly upon most of them when they expected nothing of it. And while they were saying, peace and safety, now they see that those things on which they depended for peace and safety were nothing but thin air and empty shadow. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is a pure eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince. And yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. It is to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not go to hell last night, that you were suffered to awake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep, and that there is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you arose in the morning, but that God's hand has held you up. There is no other reason to be given why you have not gone to hell since you have sat here in the house of God provoking his pure eyes with your sinful, wicked manner of attending his solemn worship. Yea, there is nothing else that is to be given as a reason why you do not this very moment drop down into hell. O oh, sinner, consider the fearful danger you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit, full of the fire of wrath that you are held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it and burn it asunder and you have no interest in any mediator and nothing to lay hold of to save yourself, nothing to keep off the flames of wrath 
nothing of your own, nothing that you have done, nothing that you can do to induce God to spare you one moment. And consider here more particularly whose wrath it is. It is the wrath of the infinite God. All the kings of the earth before God are as grasshoppers. They are nothing and less than nothing. Both their love and their hatred is to be despised. The wrath of the great king of kings is as much more terrible than theirs as his majesty is greater. Luke 12, verses 4, 5. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I forewarn you, whom ye shall fear, fear him, which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. It is the fierceness of his wrath that you are exposed to. We often read of the fury of God as in Isaiah 59, 18. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries. So Isaiah 66, 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. And in many other places, so Revelation 19, 15, we read of the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The words are exceedingly terrible. If it had only been said, the wrath of God, the words would have implied that which is infinitely dreadful. But it is the fierceness and wrath of God, the fury of God, the fierceness of Jehovah. Oh, how dreadful must that be! Who can utter or conceive what such expressions carry in them? Consider this, ye that are here present, that yet remain in an unregenerate state, that God will execute the fierceness of his anger implies that he will inflict wrath without any pity. When God behold the ineffable extremity of your case, and sees your torment to be so vastly disproportioned to your strength, and sees how your poor soul is crushed and sinks down, as it were, into an infinite gloom, he will have no compassion upon you. He will not forbear the executions of his wrath, or in the least lighten his hand. There shall be no moderation or mercy, nor will God then at all stay his rough wind. He will have no regard to your welfare, nor be at all careful lest you should suffer too much in any other sense than only that you shall not suffer beyond what strict justice requires. Nothing shall be withheld because it is so hard for you to bear. Ezekiel 8:18. 8, Therefore will I also deal in fury. My eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine eyes with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. Now God stands ready to pity you. This is a day of mercy. You may cry now with some encouragement of obtaining mercy. But when once the day of mercy is past, your most lamentable and alloyous cries of shrieks will be in vain. You will be wholly lost and thrown away of God. As to any regard to your welfare, God will have no other use to put you to but to suffer misery. You shall be continued in being to no other end, for you will be a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction. And there will be no other use of this vessel but to be filled full of wrath. God will be so far from pitying you when you cry to him that it is said he will only laugh and mock. Proverbs 1, verses 25 and 26, etc. How awful are those words, Isaiah 63, 3, which are the words of the great God. I will tread them in my anger and will trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. It is perhaps impossible to conceive of words that carry in them 
greater manifestations of these three things, contempt and hatred and fierceness of indignation, if you cry to God to pity you, he will be so far from pitying you and your doleful case or showing you the least regard or favor that instead of that, he will only thread you under his foot. And though he will know that you cannot bear the weight of omnipotence treading upon you, yet he will not regard that, but he will crush you under his feet without mercy. He will crush out your blood and make it fly, and it shall be sprinkled on his garments so as to stain all his raiment. He will not only hate you, but he will have you in the utmost contempt. No place shall be thought fit for you, but under his feet to be trodden down as the mire of the streets. The misery you are exposed to is that which God will inflict to that end, that he might show what that wrath of Jehovah is. God hath had it on his heart to show to angels and men both how excellent his love is and also how terrible his wrath is. But the great God is also willing to show his wrath and magnify the awful majesty and mighty power and the extreme sufferings of his enemies. Romans 9:22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vassals of wrath fitted to destruction? And seeing this is his design and what he has determined even to show how terrible the unrestrained wrath, the fury and fierceness of Jehovah is, he will do it to effect. There will be something accomplished and brought to pass that will be dreadful with a witness. When the great and angry God hath risen up and executed his awful vengeance on the poor sinner, and the wretch is actually suffering the infinite weight and power of his indignation, then will God call upon the whole universe to behold that awful majesty and mighty power that is to be seen in it. Isaiah 33, 12, verses 14, And the people shall be as the burnings of lime, as thorns cut up shall they be burnt in the fire. Hear, ye that are afar off, what I have done. And ye that are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Thus it will be with you that are in an unconverted state. If you continue in it, the infinite might and majesty and terribleness of the omnipotent God shall be magnified upon you in the ineffable strength of your torments. You shall be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And when you shall be in the state of suffering, the glorious inhabitants of heaven shall go forth and look on the awful spectacles that they may see what the wrath and fierceness of the Almighty is. And when they have seen it, they will fall down and adore the great power and majesty. Isaiah 66, verses 23, 24, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. It is everlasting wrath. It would be dreadful to suffer this fierceness and wrath of Almighty God one moment, but you must suffer it to all eternity. There will be no end to this exquisite, horrible misery. When you look forward, you shall see a long forever, a boundless duration before you which will swallow up your thoughts 
and amaze your soul, and you will absolutely despair of ever having any deliverance, any end, any mitigation, any rest at all. You will know certainly that you must wear out long ages, millions and millions of ages, in wrestling and conflicting with this almighty merciless vengeance. And then when you have so done, when so many ages have actually been spent by you in this manner, you will know that all is but a point to what remains, so that your punishment will indeed be infinite. Oh, who can express what the state of a soul in such circumstances is? All that we can possibly say about it gives but a feeble, faint representation of it. It is inexpressible and inconceivable, for who knows the power of God's anger? How dreadful is the state of those that are daily and hourly in the danger of this great wrath and infinite misery? But this is the dismal case of every soul in this congregation that has not been born again, however moral and strict, somber and religious they may otherwise be. Oh, that you would consider it, whether you be young or old, there is reason to think that there are many in this congregation now hearing this discourse that will actually be the subjects of this very misery to all eternity. We know not who they are, or in what seats they sit, or what thoughts they now have. It may be that they are now at ease and hear all these things without much disturbance and are now flattering themselves that they are not the persons promising themselves that they shall escape. If we knew that there was one person and but one in the whole congregation that was to be the subject of this misery, what an awful thing, what an awful sight, what an awful thing would it be to think of if we knew who it was, what an awful sight would it be to see such a person? How might all the rest of the congregation lift up a lamentable and bitter cry over it? But alas, instead of one, how many is it likely will remember this discourse in hell? And it would be a wonder if some that are now present should not be in hell in a very short time, even before this year is out. And it would be no wonder if some persons that now sit here and some seats of this meeting house in health, quiet, and secure should be there before tomorrow morning. Those of you that finally continue in a natural state that shall keep out of hell longest will be there in a little time. Your damnation does not slumber. It will come swiftly and in all probability very suddenly upon many of you you have reason to wonder that you are not already in hell. It is doubtless that the case of some whom you have seen and known that never deserved hell more than you, and that hitherto appear as likely to have been now alive as you, their case is past all hope. They are crying in extreme misery and perfect despair, but here you are in the land of the living and in the house of God and have an opportunity to obtain salvation. What would not those poor damned hopeless souls give for one day's op opportunity such as you now enjoy? And now you have an extraordinary opportunity, a day wherein Christ has thrown the door of mercy wide open and stands in calling and crying with a loud voice to poor sinners, a day wherein many are flocking to him and pressing into the kingdom of God. Many are daily coming from the east, west, north, and south, Many that were very lately in the same miserable condition that you are in are now in a happy state with their hearts filled with love to him who has loved them and washed from their sins in his own blood and rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. How awful is it to be left behind at such a day to see 
to eat so many others feasting while you are pining and perishing, to see so many rejoicing and singing for joy of heart while you have cause to mourn for sorrow of heart. And how for vexation of spirit, how can you rest one moment in such a condition? Are not your souls as precious as the souls of the people which suffered, where they are flocking from day to day to Christ? Are there not many here who have lived long in the world and are not to this day born again, and so are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and have done nothing since they have lived but treasure up wrath against the day of wrath? Oh, sirs, your case in an especial manner is extremely dangerous. Your guilt and hardness of heart is extremely great. Do not you see how generally persons of your ear, your years are passed over and left in the present remarkable and wonderful dispensation of God's mercy? You had need to consider yourselves and awake thoroughly out of sleep. You cannot bear the fierceness and wrath of the infinite God, and you, young men and young women, will you neglect this precious season which you now enjoy? when so many others of your age are renouncing all youthful vanities and flocking to Christ. You especially have now an, op an extraordinary opportunity, but if you neglect it, it will soon be with you as with those persons who spent all the precious days of youth in sin and are now come to such a dreadful pass in blindness and hardness and you, children, who are unconverted, do not you know that you are going down to hell to bear the dreadful wrath of that God who is now angry with you every day and every night? Will you be content to be the children of the devil when so many other children in the land are converted and are become the holy and happy children of the King of Kings? And let everyone that is yet out of Christ and hanging over the pit of hell, whether they be old men and women, or middle-aged, or young people, or little children, now hearken to the loud calls of God's word and providence. This acceptable year of the Lord, a day of such great favor to some, will doubtless be a day of as remarkable vengeance to others Men's hearts harden, and their guilt increases apace at such a day as this, if they neglect their souls, and never was there so great danger of such persons being given up to hardness of heart and blindness of mind. God seems now to be hastily gathering in his elect in all parts of the land, and probably with a greater part of adult persons that ever shall be saved will be brought in now in a little time, and that it will be as it was on the great outpouring of the Spirit upon the Jews and apostles' days. The election will obtain, and the rest will be blinded. If this should be the case with you, you will eternally curse this day, and will curse the day that ever you was born. To see such a season of outpouring of God's Spirit and will wish that you had died and gone to hell before you had seen it. Now undoubtedly it is as it was in the days of John the Baptist with the axe is in an extraordinary manner laid at the root of the trees that every tree which brings forth not good fruit may be hewn down and cast into the fire. Therefore, let everyone that is out of Christ now wake and fly from the wrath to come. The wrath of the Almighty God is now undoubtedly hanging over a great part of this congregation. Let everyone fly out of Sodom. Haste and escape for your lives. Look not behind you, escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. It is widely recognized that America's greatest philosopher-theologian was Jonathan Edwards, who lived in the 18th century from 1703 to 1758. 
He was a remarkable minister as well as a theologian, and he preached the most famous sermon to ever be preached in America. It's one of the very few sermons that has found its way into books of literature. Many college students will recall reading it in their American literature anthologies. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now frequently, the sermon is excerpted. It is edited so that only the most graphic parts of it are preserved for publication. And those graphic parts have to do with the sinner being held over the pit of hell much as one would hold a loathsome spider. And so it's remembered as primarily a sermon of hellfire and damnation. But it is far more than that. The sermon does have those tremendous and awe-inspiring images of hell. But it also is a call for sinners to repent and turn to God. And it was preached to Jonathan Edwards' own congregation in Northampton, Massachusetts, with very little response. People hardly reacted to the sermon at all. But later, when Edwards was asked to speak at Enfield, Connecticut, at another church, he took that sermon with him, and on July 8th, 1741, he preached Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God for a second time to a different congregation. There is an account of the reaction to the sermon at that time. We're told that the response of the Enfield congregation to the sermon was amazing. And before Edwards had finished the sermon, people were interrupting the sermon, moaning and groaning and crying out things like, what shall I do to be saved? And oh, I'm going to hell. And oh, what shall I do for Christ? And at several times, Edwards was actually obliged to stop speaking and speak to the people and desire silence that he might be heard. There was a great awakening, a great revival that was brought about in this congregation in Enfield, Connecticut because of this sermon. And so I'm going to read to you today the entire text of Jonathan Edwards' great sermon, Sinners in the, Hang in the Hands of an Angry God, which is just as much needed in our own day, if not more so, than it was more than 250 years ago. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. The text for the sermon was Deuteronomy 32:35. And it wasn't even the complete verse that was used as a text, only an excerpt from the verse. Their foot shall slide in due time. In this verse is threatened the vengeance of God on the wicked, unbelieving Israelites who were God's visible people and who lived under the means of grace but who notwithstanding all God's wonderful works toward them remained void of counsel, having no understanding in them. Under all the cultivations of heaven, they brought forth bitter and poisonous fruit. As in the two verses next preceding the text, the expression I have chosen for my text, their foot shall slide in due time, seems to imply the following things relating to the punishment and destruction to which these wicked Israelites were exposed. First, that they were always exposed to destruction, as one that stands or walks in slippery places is always exposed to fall. This is implied in the manner of their destruction coming upon them, being represented by their foot sliding. The same is expressed in Psalm 73:18. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. Second, it implies that they were also exposed to sudden unexpected destruction. As he that walks in slippery places is every moment liable to fall, he cannot foresee one moment whether he shall stand or fall the next. And when he does fall, he falls at once without warning which is also expressed in Psalm 73, 18 and 19. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? Third, another thing implied is that they're liable to fall of themselves without being thrown down by the hand of another. 
as he that stands or walks on slippery ground needs nothing but his own weight to throw him down. Fourth, that the reason why they're not fallen already and do not fall now is only that God's appointed time is not come. For it is said that when that due time or appointed time comes, their foot shall slide. Then they shall be left to fall as they are inclined by their own weight. God will not hold them up in these slippery places any longer, but will let them go. And then at that very instant they shall fall into destruction, as he that stands on such slippery declining ground on the edge of a pit, he cannot stand alone. When he is let go, he immediately falls and is lost. The observation from the words that I would now insist upon is this. There is nothing that keeps wicked men at any one moment out of hell but the mere pleasure of God. By the mere pleasure of God, I mean his sovereign pleasure, his arbitrary will, restrained by no obligation, hindered by no manner of difficulty, any more than if nothing else but God's mere will had in the least degree or in any respect whatsoever any hand in the preservation of wicked men one moment. The truth of this observation may appear by the following considerations. One, there is no want of power in God to cast wicked men into hell at any moment. Men's hands cannot be strong when God rises up. The strongest have no power to resist him, nor can any deliver out of his hands. He is not only able to cast wicked men into hell, but he can most easily do it. Sometimes an earthly prince meets with a great deal of difficulty to subdue a rebel who has found means to fortify himself and has made himself strong by the numbers of his followers. But it is not so with God. There is no fortress that is any defense from the power of God. Though hand join in hand and vast multitudes of God's enemies combine and associate themselves, they are easily broken in pieces. They are as great heaps of light chaff before the whirlwind. They are as large quantities of dry stubble before devouring flames. We find it easy to tread on and crush a worm that we see crawling on the earth. So it is easy for us to cut or singe a slender thread that anything hangs by. Thus easy is it for God when he pleases to cast his enemies down to hell. What are we that we should think to stand before him at whose rebuke the earth trembles and before whom the rocks are thrown down? Two, they deliver, they deserve, to be cast into hell, so that divine justice never stands in the way. It makes no objection against God's using his power at any moment to destroy them. Yea, on the contrary, justice calls aloud for an infinite punishment of their sins. Divine justice says that the tree that brings forth such grapes of Sodom, cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? The sword of divine justice is every moment brandished over their heads. And it is nothing but the hand of arbitrary mercy and God's mere will that holds it back. Third, they're already under a sentence of condemnation to hell. They do not only justly deserve to be cast down thither, but the sentence of the law of God, that eternal and immutable rule of righteousness that God has fixed between him and mankind is gone out against them and stands against them so that they are bound over already to hell. John 3.18, he that believeth not is condemned already. So that every unconverted man properly belongs to hell. That is his place. From thence he is. John 8, 23, ye are from beneath, and thither he is bound. It is the place that justice and God's word and the sentence of his unchangeable law assign to him. Fourth, there are now the objects of that very same anger and wrath of God that is expressed in the torments of hell. And the reason why they do not go down to hell at each moment is not because God, in whose power they are, is not then very angry with them, as he is with many miserable creatures now tormented in hell who feel there and bear the fierceness of his wrath. 
Yea, God is a great deal more angry with great numbers that are now on earth. Yea, doubtless with many that are now in this congregation, who it may be are at ease than he is with many of those who are now in the flames of hell. So that it is not because God is unmindful of their wickedness and does not resent it that he does not let loose his hand and cut them off. God is not altogether such a one as themselves, though they may imagine him to be so. The wrath of God burns against them. Their damnation does not slumber. The pit is prepared. The fire is made ready. The furnace is now hot, ready to receive them. The flames do now rage and glow. The glittering sword is wet and held over them, and the pit hath opened its mouth under them. Fifth, the devil stands ready to fall upon them and seize them as his own at what moment God shall permit him. They belong to him. He has their souls in his possession and under his dominion. The scripture represents them as his goods. The devils watch them. They are ever by them at their right hand. They stand waiting for them like greedy, hungry lions that see their prey and expect to have it, but are for the present kept back. If God should withdraw his hand by which they are restrained, they would in one moment fly upon their poor souls. The old serpent is gaping for them. Hell opens its mouth wide to receive them, and if God should permit it, they would be hastily swallowed up and lost. Sixth, there are in the souls of wicked men those hellish principles reigning that would presently kindle and flame out into hell fire if it were not for God's restraints. There is laid in the very nature of carnal men a foundation for the torments of hell. There are those corrupt principles in reigning power in them and in full possession of them that are seeds of hell fire. These principles are active and powerful, exceeding violent in their nature. And if it were not for the restraining hand of God upon them, they would soon break out, they would flame out after the same manner as the same corruptions, the same enmity does in the hearts of damned souls and would beget the same torments as they do in them. The souls of the wicked are in Scripture compared to the troubled sea. Isaiah 57, 20. For the present, God restrains their wickedness by his mighty power, as he does the raging waves of the troubled sea, saying, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. And if God should withdraw that restraining power, it would soon carry all before it. Sin is the ruin and misery of the soul. It is destructive in its nature. And if God should leave it without restraint, there would need nothing else to make the soul perfectly miserable. The corruption of the heart of man is immoderate and boundless in its fury. And while wicked men live here, it is like fire pent up by God's restraints. Whereas if it were let loose, it would set on fire the course of nature. And as the heart is now a sink of sin, so if sin was not restrained, it would immediately turn the soul into a fire fiery oven or a furnace of fire and brimstone. Seventh, it is no security to wicked men for one moment that there are no visible means of death at hand. It is no security to a natural man that he is now in health, that he does not see which way he should now immediately go out of the world by any accident, and that there is no visible danger in any respect in his circumstances. The manifold and continual experience of the world in all ages shows this is no evidence that a man is not on the very brink of eternity and that the next step will not be into another world. The unseen, unthought of ways and means of persons going suddenly out of the world are innumerable and inconceivable. Unconverted men walk over the pit of hell on a rotten covering, and there are innumerable places in this covering so weak that they will not bear their weight, and those places are not seen. The arrows of death fly unseen at noonday. The sharpest sight cannot discern them. God has so many different and searchable ways of taking wicked men out of the world and sending them to hell that there is nothing to make it appear that God hath need to be at the expense of a miracle or go out of the ordinary course of his providence to destroy any wicked man at any moment. All the means that there are of sinners going out of the world are so in God's hands and so universally and absolutely subject to his power and determination 
that it does not depend at all, the less on the mere will of God, whether sinners shall at any moment go to hell, that if means were never made use of, are at all concerned in the case. Eighth, natural men's prudence and care to preserve their own lives or the care of others to preserve them do not secure them a moment. To this divine providence and universal experience do also bear testimony. There is this clear evidence that men's own wisdom is no security to them from death, that if it were otherwise we should see some difference between the wise and politic men of the world and others with regard to their liableness to early and unexpected death. But how is it in fact, Ecclesiastes 2.16? How dieth the wise man, even as the fool? Ninth, all wicked men's pains and contrivance, which they use to escape hell while they continue to reject Christ and so remain wicked men, do not secure them from hell one moment. Almost every natural man that hears of hell flatters himself that he shall escape it. He depends upon himself for his own security. He flatters himself in what he has done, and what he is now doing, or what he intends to do. Every one lays out matters in his own mind how he shall avoid damnation, and flatters himself that he contrives well for himself, and that his schemes will not fail. They hear indeed that there are but few saved, and that the greater part of men that have died heretofore are gone to hell. But each one imagines that he lays out matters better for his own escape than others have done. He does not intend to come to that place of torment. He says within himself that he intends to take effectual care and to order matters so for himself as not to fail. But the foolish children of men deliberately miserably delude themselves in their own schemes and in confidence in their own strength and wisdom. They trust to nothing but a shadow. The greater part of those who heretofore have lived under the same means of grace and are now dead are undoubtedly gone to hell. And it was not because they were not as wise as those who are now alive. It was not because they did not lay out matters as well for themselves to secure their own escape. If we could speak with them and inquire of them one by one whether they expected when alive and when they used to hear about hell ever to be the subjects of that misery, we doubtless should hear one and another reply, No! I never intended to come here. I had laid out matters otherwise in my mind. I thought I should contrive well for myself. I thought my scheme good. I intended to take effectual care, but it came upon me unexpected. I did not look for it at that time, and in that manner it came as a thief. Death outwitted me. God's wrath was too quick for me. Oh, my cursed foolishness, I was flattering myself and pleasing myself with vain dreams of what I would do hereafter. And when I was saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction came upon me. Tenth, God has laid himself under no obligation by any promise to keep any natural man out of hell one moment. God certainly has made no promises either of eternal life or of any deliverance or preservation from eternal death, but what are contained in the covenant of grace, the promises that are given in Christ, in whom all the promises are yea and amen. But surely they have no interest in the promises of the covenant of grace who are not the children of the covenant, who do not believe in any of the promises and have no interest in the mediator of the covenant, so that whatever some have imagined and pretended about promises made to natural men's earnest seeking and knocking, it is plain and manifest that whatever pains a natural man takes in religion, whatever prayers he makes, Till he believes in Christ, God is under no manner of obligation to keep him a moment from eternal destruction. So that, thus it is that natural men are held in the hand of God over the pit of hell. They have deserved the fiery pit and are already sentenced to it. 
and God is dreadfully provoked. His anger is as great toward them as to those that are actually suffering the executions of the fierceness of his wrath in hell. And they have done nothing in the least to appease or abate that anger. Neither is God in the least bound by any promise to hold them up one moment. The devil is waiting for them. Hell is gaping for them. The flames gather and flash about them and would fain lay hold on them and swallow them up. The fire pent up in their own hearts is struggling to break out and they have no interest in any mediator. There are no means within reach that can be security to them. In short, they have no refuge, nothing to take hold of. All that preserves them every moment is the mere arbitrary will and uncovenanted, unobliged forbearance of an incensed God. The use of this awful subject may be for awakening unconverted persons in this congregation. This that you have heard is the case of every one of you that are out of Christ. That world of misery, that lake of burning brimstone is extended abroad under you. There is the dreadful pit of the glowing flames of the wrath of God. There is hell's wide gaping mouth open and you have nothing to stand upon nor anything to take hold of. There is nothing between you and hell but the air. It is only the power and mere pleasure of God that holds you up. You probably are not sensible of this. You find you are kept out of hell but you do not see the hand of God in it. But look at other things as the good state of your bodily constitution, your care of your own life, and the means you use for your own preservation. But indeed, these things are nothing. If God should withdraw his hand, they would avail no more to keep you from falling than the thin air to hold up a person that is suspended in it. Your wickedness makes you, as it were, heavy as lead and to tend downwards with great weight and pressure towards hell. And if God should let you go, you would immediately sink and swiftly descend and plunge into the bottomless gulf and your healthy constitution and all your own care and prudence and best contrivance and all your righteousness would have no more influence to uphold you and keep you out of hell than a spider's web would have to stop a falling rock. Were it not for the sovereign pleasure of God, the earth would not bear you one moment, for you are a burden to it. The creation groans with you. The creature is made subject to the bondage of your corruption, not willingly. The sun does not willingly shine upon you to give you light to serve sin and Satan. The earth does not willingly yield her increase to satisfy your lusts, nor is it willingly a stage for your wickedness to be acted upon. The air does not willingly serve you for breath to maintain the flame of life in your vitals while you spend your life in the service of God's enemies. God's creatures are good and were made for men to serve God with and do not willingly subserve to any other purpose and groan when they are abused to purposes so directly contrary to their nature and end. And the world would spew you out were it not for the sovereign hand of him who hath subjected it in hope. There are the black clouds of God's wrath now hanging directly over your heads, full of the dreadful storm and big with thunder. And were it not for the restraining hand of God, it would immediately burst forth upon you. The sovereign pleasure of God for the present stays his rough wind. Otherwise, it would come with fury, and your destruction would come like a whirlwind, and you would be like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. The wrath of God is like great waters that are damned for the present. They increase more and more and rise higher and higher till an outlet is given, and the longer the stream is stopped, the more rapid and mighty is its course when once it is let loose. It is true that judgment against your evil works has not been executed hitherto. The floods of God's vengeance have been withheld, but your guilt in the meantime is constantly increasing, and you are every day treasuring up more wrath. 
the waters are constantly rising and waxing more and more mighty and there is nothing but the mere pleasure of God that holds the waters back that are unwilling to be stopped and press hard to go forward if God should only withdraw his hand from the floodgate it would immediately fly open and the fiery floods of the fierceness and wrath of God would rush forth with inconceivable fury and would come upon you with omnipotent power and if your strength were 10,000 times greater than it is yea 10,000 times greater than the strength of the stoutest sturdy devil in hell it would be nothing to withstand or endure it the bow of God's wrath is bent and the arrow made ready on the string and justice bends the arrow at your heart and strains the bow and it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood Thus all you that never passed under a great change of heart by the mighty power of the Spirit of God upon your souls, all you that were never born again and made new creatures and raised from being dead in sin to a state of new and before altogether unexperienced light and life are in the hands of an angry God. However, you may have reformed your life in many things and may have had religious affections and may keep up a form of religion in your families and closets and in the house of God, it is nothing but his mere pleasure that keeps you from being this moment swallowed up in everlasting destruction. However unconvinced you may now be of the truth of what you hear, by and by you will be fully convinced of it. Those that are gone from being in the like circumstances with you see that it was so with them. For destruction came suddenly upon most of them when they expected nothing of it and while they were saying peace and safety, now they see that those things on which they depended for peace and safety were nothing but thin air and empty shadows. The God who holds you over the pit of hell much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince. And yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. It is to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not go to hell the last night. That you were suffered to awake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep. And there is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you arose in the morning, but that God's hand has held you up. There is no other reason to be given why you have not gone to hell since you have sat here in the house of God, provoking his pure eyes by your sinful, wicked manner of attending his solemn worship. Yea, there is nothing else that is to be given as a reason why you do not this very moment drop down into hell. Oh, sinner, consider the fearful danger you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit full of the fire of wrath that you're held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it and burn it asunder and you have no interest in any mediator and nothing to lay hold of to save yourself. Nothing to keep off the flames of wrath nothing of your own, nothing that you have ever done, nothing that you can do to induce God to spare you one moment. And consider here more particularly whose wrath it is. It is the wrath of the infinite God. If it were only the wrath of man, though it were of the most potent prince, it would be comparatively little to be regarded. 
The wrath of kings is very much dreaded, especially of absolute monarchs who have the possessions and lives of their subjects wholly in their power to be disposed of at their mere will. Proverbs 20, 20 verse 2, the fear of a king is as the roaring of a lion. Whoso provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own soul. The subject that very much enrages an arbitrary prince is liable to suffer the most extreme torments that human art can invent or human power can inflict. But the greatest earthly potentates in their greatest majesty and strength and when clothed in their greatest terrors are but feeble, despicable worms of the dust in comparison of the great and almighty creator and king of heaven and earth. It is but little that they can do when most enraged and when they have exerted the utmost of their fury. All the kings of the earth before God are as grasshoppers. They are nothing and less than nothing. Both their love and their hatred is to be despised. The wrath of the great king of kings is as much more terrible than theirs as his majesty is greater. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body and after that have no more than they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Luke 12, 4 and 5. Second, it is the fierceness of his wrath that you are exposed to. We often read of the fury of God. As in Isaiah, according to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. And in many other places, so Revelation 19, 15, we read of the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The words are exceeding terrible. If it had only been said the wrath of God, the words would have implied that which is infinitely dreadful, but it is the fierceness and wrath of God, the fury of God, the fierceness of Jehovah. Oh, how dreadful must that be? Who can utter or conceive? what such expressions carry in them. But it is also the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, as though there would be a very great manifestation of His almighty power in what the fierceness of His wrath should inflict, as though omnipotence should be, as it were, enraged and exerted as men are wont to exert their strength in the fierceness of their wrath. Oh, then what will be the consequence? What will become of the poor worm that shall suffer it? Whose hands can be strong and whose heart can endure to what a dreadful, inexpressible, inconceivable depth of misery must the poor creature be sunk who shall be? the subject of this. Consider this, you that are here present, that yet remain in an unregenerate state, that God will execute the fierceness of his anger implies that he will inflict wrath without any pity. When God beholds the ineffable extremity of your case and sees your torment to be so vastly disproportioned to your strength, and sees how your poor soul is crushed and sinks down, as it were, into an infinite gloom. He will have no compassion upon you. He will not forbear the executions of his wrath or in the least lighten his hand. There shall be no moderation or mercy, nor will God then at all stay his rough wind. He will have no regard to your welfare, nor be at all careful lest you should suffer too much in any other sense then only that you shall not suffer beyond what strict justice requires. Nothing shall be withheld because it is so hard for you to bear. Ezekiel 8, 18, Therefore will I also deal in fury, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, and though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. Now God stands ready to pity you. This is a day of mercy. You may cry now with some encouragement of obtaining mercy. But when once the day of mercy is past, your most lamentable and dolorous cries and streaks will be in vain. You will be wholly lost and thrown away of God 
as to any regard to your welfare. God will have no other use to put you to but to suffer misery. You shall be continued in being to no other end, for you will be a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction, and there will be no other use of this vessel but to be filled full of wrath. God will be so far from pitying you when you cry to him that it is said he will only laugh and mock Proverbs 1, 25 and 26. How awful are those words. Isaiah 63, 3, which are the words of the great God. I will tread them in mine anger and will trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment. It is perhaps impossible to conceive of words that carry in them greater manifestations of these three things. Contempt and hatred and fierceness of indignation. If you cry to God to pity you, he will be so far from pitying you in your doleful case or showing you the least regard or favor that instead of that, he will only tread you underfoot. And though he will know that you cannot bear the weight of omnipotence treading upon you, yet he will not regard that, but he will crush you under his feet without mercy. He will crush out your blood and make it fly, and it shall be sprinkled on his garments so as to stain all his raiment. He will not only hate you, but he will have you in the utmost contempt. No place shall be thought fit for you but under his feet to be trodden down as the mire of the streets. Third, the misery you are exposed to is that which God will inflict to that end that he might show what that wrath of Jehovah is. God hath had it on his heart to show to angels and men both how excellent his love is and also how terrible his wrath is. Sometimes earthly kings have a mind to show how terrible their wrath is by the extreme punishments they would execute on those that would provoke them. Nebuchadnezzar, that mighty and haughty monarch of the Chaldean Empire, was willing to show his wrath when enraged with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and accordingly gave orders that the burning fiery furnace should be heated seven times hotter than it was before. Doubtless it was raised to the utmost degree of fierceness that human art could raise it. But the great God is also willing to show his wrath and magnify his awful majesty and mighty power in the extreme sufferings of his enemies. Romans 9, 22, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and seeing this is his design and what he has determined, even to show how terrible the unrestrained wrath, the fury and fierceness of Jehovah is, he will do it to effect There will be something accomplished and brought to pass that will be dreadful with a witness when the great and angry God hath risen up and executed his awful vengeance on the poor sinner and the wretch is actually suffering the infinite weight and power of his indignation. Then will God call upon the whole universe to behold that awful majesty and mighty power that is to be seen in it. Isaiah 33, 12 through 14, And the people shall be as the burnings of lime, as thorns cut up shall they be burnt in the fire. Hear ye that are afar off what I have done, and ye that are near acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surpassed the hypocrites. Thus it will be with you that are in an unconverted state, if you continue in it. The infinite might and majesty and terribleness of the omnipotent God shall be magnified upon you in the ineffable strength of your torments. You shall be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And when you shall be in this state of suffering, The glorious inhabitants of heaven shall go forth and look on the awful spectacle that they may see what the wrath and fierceness of the Almighty is. And when they have seen it, they will fall down and adore that great power and majesty. And it shall come to pass, says Isaiah, that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. 
for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Isaiah 66, 23 and 24. Fourth, it is an everlasting wrath. It would be dreadful to suffer this fierceness and wrath of Almighty God one moment, but you must suffer it for all eternity. There will be no end to this exquisite, horrible misery. When you look forward, you shall see a long forever, a boundless duration before your eyes which will swallow up your thoughts and amaze your soul, and you will absolutely despair of ever having any deliverance, any end, any mitigation, any rest at all. You will know certainly that you must wear out long ages, millions and millions of ages in wrestling and conflicting with this almighty merciless vengeance. And then when you have so done, when so many ages have actually been spent by you in this manner, you will know that all is but a point to what remains, so that your punishment will indeed be infinite. Oh, who can express what the state of a soul in such circumstances is? All that we can possibly say about it gives but a very feeble, faint representation of it. It is an inexpressible and inconceivable, for who knows the power of God's anger? How dreadful is the state of those who are daily and hourly in danger of this great wrath and infinite mercy. But this is the dismal case of every soul in this congregation that has not yet been born again, however moral or strict, sober and righteous they may otherwise be. Oh, that you would consider it, whether you be young or old. There is reason to think that there are many in this congregation now hearing this discourse that will actually be the subjects of this very misery to all eternity. We know not who they are, or in what seats they sit, or what thoughts they now have. It may be they are now at ease, and hear all these things without much disturbance, and are now flattering themselves that they are not the persons, promising themselves that they shall escape if we knew that there was but one person and but one in the whole congregation that was to be the subject of this misery, what an awful thing would it be to think of? If we knew who it was, what an awful sight would it be to see such a person? How might all the rest of the congregation lift up a lamentable and bitter cry over him? But alas, instead of one, how many is it likely will remember this discourse in hell? And it would be a wonder if some that are now present should not be in hell in a very short time, even before this year is out. And it would be no wonder if some persons that now sit here in some seats of this meeting house in health, quiet and secure, should be there before tomorrow morning. Those of you that finally continue in a natural condition that shall keep out of hell longest will be there in a little time. Your damnation does not slumber. It will come swiftly and in all probability very suddenly upon many of you. You have reason to wonder that you're not already in hell. It is doubtless the case of some whom you have seen and known that never deserved hell more than you and that heretofore appeared as likely to have been now alive as you. Their case is past all hope. They are crying in extreme misery and perfect despair. But here you are, in the land of the living and in the house of God, and have an opportunity to obtain salvation. What would not those poor damned, hopeless souls give for one day's opportunity such as you now enjoy. And now you have 
an extraordinary opportunity, a day wherein Christ has thrown the door of mercy wide open and stands in calling and crying with a loud voice to poor sinners, a day wherein many are flocking to him and pressing into the kingdom of God. Many are daily coming from the east, west, north, and south. Many that were very lately in the same miserable condition that you are in are now in a happy state with their hearts filled with love to him who has loved them and washed them from their sins in his own blood and rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. How awful is it to be left behind at such a day, to see so many others feasting while you are pining and perishing, to see so many rejoicing and singing for joy of heart while you have cause to mourn for sorrow of heart and howl for vexation of spirit. How can you rest one moment in such a condition? Are not your poor souls as precious as the souls of the people at Suffield, where they're flocking from day to day to Christ? Are there not many here who have lived long in the world and are not to this day born again, and so are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and have done nothing ever since they have lived but treasure up wrath against the day of wrath? Oh, sirs, your case in an especial manner is extremely dangerous. Your guilt and hardness of heart is extremely great. Do you not see how generally persons of your years are passed over and left in the present remarkable and wonderful dispensation of God's mercy. You had need to consider yourselves and to wake thoroughly out of sleep. You cannot bear the fierceness and wrath of the infinite God. And you, young men and young women, Will you neglect this precious season which you now enjoy when so many others of your age are renouncing all youthful vanities and flocking to Christ? You especially have now an extraordinary opportunity. But if you neglect it, it will soon be with you as with those persons who spent all the precious days of youth in sin and are now come to such a dreadful pass in blindness and hardness. And you children who are unconverted, do you not know that you are going down to hell to bear the dreadful wrath of that God who is now angry with you every day and every night? Will you be content to be the children of the devil when so many other children in the land are converted and are become the holy and happy children of the King of Kings? And let every one that is yet out of Christ and hanging over the pit of hell, whether they be old men and women or middle-aged or young people or little children, now hearken to the loud calls of God's word and providence. This acceptable year of the Lord, a day of such great favor to some, will doubtless be a day of as remarkable vengeance to others. Men's hearts harden, and their guilt increases apace at such a day as this if they neglect their souls. And never was there so great danger of such persons being given up to hardness of heart and blindness of mind. God seems now to be hastily gathering in his elect in all parts of the land, and probably the greater part of adult persons that ever shall be saved will be brought in now in a little time, and that it will be as it was on the great outpouring of the Spirit upon the Jews in the apostles' days. The election will obtain, and the rest will be blinded. If this should be the case with you, you will eternally curse this day and will curse the day that ever you was born 
to see such a season of the pouring out of God's Spirit and will wish you had died and gone to hell before you had seen it. Now undoubtedly it is as it was in the days of John the Baptist. The axe is in an extraordinary manner laid at the root of the trees that every tree which brings not forth good fruit may be hewn down and cast into the fire. Therefore, let everyone that is out of Christ now awaken and fly from the wrath to come. The wrath of Almighty God is now undoubtedly hanging over a great part of this congregation. Let everyone fly out of Sodom. Haste and escape for your lives. Look not behind you. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. As Jonathan Edwards preached this sermon, the reaction of the congregation was such that people began to cry out and moan. They interrupted him several times during the sermon, saying, what must I do to be saved? Stephen Williams was there in the church in Enfield, Connecticut on that July 8th, 1741. This is what he described about the sermon. We went over to Enfield where we met dear Mr. Edwards of Northampton who preached a most awakening sermon from these words, Deuteronomy 32, 35. And before the sermon was done, there was a great moaning and crying out through the whole house, what shall I do to be saved? Oh, I'm going to hell. Or what shall I do for Christ? And so on and so on. So that the minister was obliged to desist. The shrieks and cries were piercing and amazing. After some time of waiting, the congregation were still so that a prayer was made by Mr. W. And after that, we descended from the pulpit and discoursed with the people, some in one place and some in another. And amazing and astonishing, the power of God was seen. And several souls were hopefully wrought upon that night. And oh, the cheerfulness and pleasantness of their countenances that received comfort. Oh, that God would strengthen and confirm. We sung a hymn and prayed and dismissed the assembly. People were changed in that sermon. People were changed because of the power of the Spirit of God. As you've heard the sermon today, there may have been moments when you thought, this is interesting as a piece of history, as a lesson from America's historical past. You may have wondered at some of the phrases in the sermon. You may have thought the language antiquated. Perhaps you thought the theology outmoded and outdated. But even if the language is quaint and belongs to a past era, much of the phraseology was biblical, and all of the concepts were scriptural. And the words that Jonathan Edwards spoke more than 250 years ago are still true. Yes, there is a heaven to which we hope to go. But there also is a hell. There also is a place prepared for the devil and his angels into which human beings will be cast. And they will be cast there because it is the ultimate place of separation from God. And that is what human beings want who are sinners. They rebel against God. They rebel against his laws. And they do not want to have him in their thinking. I hope you're not one of those people today. I hope that this sermon has awakened you. I hope that you are now fearful of hell because that's a very good reason to seek the one whom God has sent, the Lord Jesus Christ. God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ died on the cross. There. He took hell. He took the wrath of God for all those who will repent of their sins and believe in Him as their Lord and Savior. Now, you cannot repent of your sins on your own, and you cannot come 
to faith in Jesus Christ on your own. But what I hope is that you will use what you've heard today to allow yourself to be driven to prayer, to read in your Bible, perhaps beginning with the Gospel of John, to read about the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then to begin to seek the face of God and to begin to tell him that you realize that you have broken his law. If you don't know what his law is, look in Exodus 20 and look at Matthew chapters 5 through 7. You'll see yourself there. You'll see that you are a rebel against God. And not only have you broken his laws individually and in acts of sin that you've committed, but also in your heart, in your thoughts. You need his help to repent and believe. I urge you to call upon the Lord, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to ask him to bring you to genuine sorrow and repentance for your sins, to ask him to give you genuine faith in him, to keep calling upon him, to keep seeking him in his word. You cannot birth yourself again, but by his help you can repent and have faith in him. If you do not do that in this life, there is a sure and certain hell waiting for you in the life to come. Many of those you know are there already. It is not, never has been, nor ever will be a pleasant place. People will not be able to repent there. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They will be separated from God. And the way to avoid that separation is to repent and believe on Jonathan Edwards' Savior and mine, and I hope yours, the Lord Jesus Christ. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled, Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are, Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, Vessel to You, Waiting to Hear from You, Jesus Is, and Others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, right now, free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, -E -E in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at aol.com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you, and may the Lord bless you and yours. To the